complexity imperative. So we've heard from a very broad range of, uh, of people and expertise and backgrounds and topics today. And I thought it was time that we moved towards solutions to all these problems that we've been identifying and all these challenges. So I'm going to start off with a couple of home truths just to bring us back down to earth. Um, I'm then going to talk a little bit about concentrate mostly on sustainable food. Um, I'm then going to talk about moving towards the solutions to some of the problems that we have in reaching the goal of sustainable food. And in doing that, I'm going to talk about systems. And I'll tell a little bit more about what I mean by systems later. And then I'm going to finish up uh, with the solution to the problems relating to food, carbon, health, soil security, and climate in 17 minutes and 15 seconds. <laughs> Home truth number one. We used to, I, I get the impression, talking to a lot of people, that we tend to think that we're doing terrible things to the environment now and it's awful and if only it could be like good old days when we used to live in harmony with the environment. Well, you have to look back a long, long time before you can find people that lived in harmony with the environment, except actually in Australia, where you don't have to look that far behind, just maybe 200 years before we all arrived. Um, we've never been in harmony with our environment, at least since we developed agriculture. The Garden of Eden, where agriculture started, the Fertile Crescent, lost most of its soil after about 30 generations of people starting farming and, and living there. Uh, and they've never got it back. Uh, archaeological evidence from just about everywhere that we look, shows that civilizations, all the big civilizations, the Roman Empire, the Greeks, the Mayans, all these great civilizations, um, grew steadily and exponentially and then declined very rapidly. So just about everywhere we look, there's a cyclical, cyclical um, prosperity since the Bronze Age. So you've got centuries-long periods of, of gradual growth leading to a very rapid uh, exponential rise in population and then a sudden crash. And those crashes are associated with accelerated soil erosion and then rapid depopulation. People moving off the land, going somewhere else, followed by millennia long periods of soil formation and slow revegetation through natural processes. Home truth number two, is that the interesting thing is that the people at the time knew they had the technology to do a lot better than they did. They just didn't do it. So we've never lacked the potential for more sustainable food production. And the problem is we, things had to get really, really bad before anything was put in place to try and reverse the situation. And by that time, it was too late. And the interesting question is, well, why do we have to wait until things get really sore and really painful before we do anything about it? And that's kind of a theme uh, that I'd like to bring up a little bit later. Home truth number three is that we tend to think of ourselves as being outside the environment and we do things to the environment. But actually, the truth is we are very much part of the environment and we're doing exactly what every other species on the planet is trying to do. All the other species on the planet look to us with envy. We are spectacularly successful at doing what they are also trying to do. This idea that Mother Nature is this malevolent force that looks after us all and is nurturing is just nonsense. Uh, Mother Nature is horrible, horrible person. Darwinian selection is an incredibly ugly process. You just need to sit outside and look in the environment and see things eating each other and out-competing each other for space. Uh, almost every species fills the niche available to it to the brim, to up until resources are limiting the population. So most species on the planet are literally living in their niches on the edge of survivability. We, we do the same, of course, but technology has opened up a whole bunch of new uh, niches to us that, that weren't, wouldn't otherwise be available. And in fact, if you take technology and including 
clothes and heating and all that stuff and put us out in the environment, well, at least I would last for probably about 20 minutes or so. We insulate ourselves from the environment. We've, we've been spectacularly successful at, at succeeding by creating new niches for ourselves. Um, however, I would say where we do stand out is that we are um, unsurpassed, except for a very few species early on in the evolution of life, in that we degrade the life support system uh, capacity of, of the environment to an incredible extent. And we and I have nowhere else to run. We've seen diagrams like this one, uh, where we're now on the, on the lower uh, right-hand side there, we have about a quarter of a hectare of, arable, of, of agricultural land for each person on the planet. And that's about half the amount of land that we had just about 50 years ago. So that's pretty rapid increase in population and decline in the available availability of, of agricultural land. So what does all this mean? It means that, uh, bottom line is, the problems that we face are largely problems of our choosing. There are now more obese people than starving people in the, in the, in the world, for example. It's consumption, not starvation, or population growth that's the main factor driving our need to produce something like 50% more food by 2030. We have the capacity to produce enough food for everybody. The problem lies in the way we choose to distribute it and the way we choose to consume. And that's true of food, it's also true of energy, it's true of water, it's true of a lot of things. So where does that take us? Um, this is where we are now. We, after seven or actually 11,000 years of, of agriculture, we've arrived at the position of where we use something like 50 times the amount of energy to get the same equivalent energy from the environment as, as our hunter-gatherer ancestors did. Um, and we're at the situation now where literally three billion people and something like a third of the population of the planet eats oil in the sense of the oil that fuels the production of nitrogen fertilizer. So when we're talking about move it, removing our dependency on oil, you know, it's, we've got to replace uh, that capacity to feed people with something else. Our soils, 40% of the world's agricultural soils are either degraded or severely degraded. And when we talk about severe de degradation, we're talking about 70% of the topsoil is gone. Um, this leads to loss of natural fertility of the system. So it's a trajectory going in the wrong direction, if you like. It's also loss of water storage. Our soils, as they become degraded, are less able to store water, the water that the plants need to grow to produce our food. A third of the water withdrawals are unsustainable globally. Uh, the, the map on the right-hand side there shows where the, the red areas are um, the areas in 1990 that were suffering severe water stress. By severe water stress, we're talking about less than half a million litres of water per year, which sounds like a lot, but apparently that puts us on the edge of survivability. That's what the picture will look like in 2030. Around half of the world's population will suffer severe water stress if we continue consuming the rate at which we're consuming uh, now and if our consumption goes up as anticipated as the developing world becomes more developed. So that's where we are now and where I believe the solution lies is not to think about all these separate problems and try and deal with every problem on its own but is to try and think of the whole system of problems and try and solve everything at once. That seems a lot easier, seems a lot quicker. Here's an example of where thinking of, a, thinking of, of a, a bunch of issues as a system leads to a more efficient solution. We've uh, heard a lot about carbon and the role of carbon in soil. Uh, principally, the reason why carbon is important in soil is because it feeds the microbes. Microbes, if we took all the microbes out of soil and, and made them into sheep, we would have something like 2,000 sheep per hectare of good uh, pasture soil. 
uh, equivalent of microbes abo uh, above the ground. And what we now know about uh, soil is if we treat it as a single system, in other words, if we understand the interactions between plants, soil, and the microorganisms, we can solve many problems at once. Because uh, soil is capable, the interactions between these components are capable of repairing and recovering the, the soil to its more fertile state. So we can uh, make the soil more fert fertile, we can uh, have uh, solve a lot of the problems to do with erosion, and we can uh, make the water, make uh, the soil st store more water. And here's an example of uh, 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 simulated water flowing through soil, in this case, a low carbon soil on the left hand side, and on the right hand side, we have a higher carbon soil. The point there is, in the high carbon soil, the water fills much more of the volume than in the low carbon soil, where the water just tends to flow through and, and, and isn't held there. So carbon is the fuel that allows soil, the soil plant microbe system, to continue to repair itself, despite the fact that we may continue to put it under stress to produce food. Provided there's enough carbon, everything else just emerges, right? So we can solve lots of problems by addressing one issue, which is the carbon in soil. Now let's take a look at some of the bigger problems, which is uh, the problems facing the entire planet over the next 10 years, as predicted by the World Economic Forum. What you can see here are a whole bunch of different problems. Uh, the bigger uh, um, symbols on the on the graph represent different kinds of challenges like uh, climate change and economic uh, disparity and uh, air pollution and all sorts of funny things, volcanoes and things. The interesting thing here is not so much the different range of problems, but the fact is that they're highly interconnected. Now that kind of makes a nonsense of the of the of the idea of trying to come up or predict risks because because the risks are so highly interconnected. If one thing happens, obviously that risk then propagates across the whole network and changes the whole landscape of future risk. Nevertheless, what is interesting is you can, you can draw, and, and, and the World Economic Forum did this, they drew out three particularly highly connected and, and uh, tightly connected uh, nexus of risks. The two on the left there relate to macroeconomic macro -economic instabilities. And this is the kind of thing that we're seeing just now, where stock market is flying all over the place uh, uh, as, as market prices crash and then the cover and then crash again. And the very real possibility that the world will enter into a second phase of uh, financial crisis. That's all the money stuff. All of that is going to focus attention on the basic requirements of life, which is the, th the, the, uh, the third nexus on the right-hand side there. That risk nexus involves uh, risks associated with energy price volatility, water security, food security, and climate change. And of course, implicated in all of that is human health. Because these risks are highly interconnected and are strongly interconnected, it also means that potentially the solutions to those problems are highly related. So the complexity of the challenges that we face are probably their Achilles heel in terms of finding a solution. So you can view interconnectedness as a huge opportunity. For example, soil is highly degraded. Soil's biological properties are linked to its physical properties. Good soil uses less energy and water. Good soil supports human health. Soil regulates climate. Increased demand on soil is more strongly linked to rising consumption, and consumption is linked to an obesity epidemic. So all these things are linked together. We may, and that means we may need to do only a few things to change everything. However, the argument against that is that, well, if we start to try and understand how everything is connected and how everything affects everything else, it just becomes too big and too complicated. And you show one of these complicated network diagrams to a politician and they just you know, it's just too complicated. But I'm going to tell you there's a difference between complicated and complexity. 
And complexity in this case is our friend in terms of trying to find a solution. So let's think carefully about what we mean by complexity and what's different between complexity and complicated. If we make a complicated problem simple, we make it better. If we make a complex problem simple, we make it wrong. And I'll give you an example of that. Think about how our bodies work. So every cell in our body is unimaginably complicated. Um, despite that fact, we continue to function very well under stressful conditions, like standing up and making a presentation, or eating, or drinking, or running 25 marathons in four days, or whatever it was. Uh, our bodies continue to function. The problems arise when this complexity becomes simple. And on the right-hand side there, we've got a diagram of what the principal reaction, uh, reactions involve implicated in, 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 in cancer at the cellular level. Cancer happens when links in that network, that signaling and control network in the cell, get broken. However, isn't it just all uh, overwhelming to try and explain to try and uh, characterize that whole network of interactions or that whole global network of risks or all those interactions that manage our, our food system. Well, this is where the complexity comes in. So if the behavior of a complex system is resilient, it means that the details don't matter. And what I mean by that is that you can change parts of the system quite radically, but the whole system will continue to behave nicely. That's what resilience means. And what matters is what is there, what's in the system, what you include in the system, what it's linked to, and how. That's much more important than the details of the, of the links. Therefore, because of this resilience in, the, in, in these complex systems, we don't need to know everything about complex systems. Uh, and they don't have to be finely tuned. So the solutions to these kind of complex problems are a kind of perfect mess. You don't need to know the details. Uh, you don't need to tune everything so it just works fine. Provided you've got the right kind of solution, it'll be robust. And that's the key point. You can argue whether climate change is true. You can argue whether we've got enough food. You can argue all these issues. But the bottom line is that we will never know for sure one way or the other. And in the face of that inevitable uncertainty, our solutions have to be robust to our ignorance. We don't have the time to make lots of mistakes. What we do know is that the issues are pressing. So our food system must be productive, efficient, and resilient in the face of an uncertain future. On the right-hand side there, those are the kinds of networks that link the soil all the way through to society. The choices we make in our consumption, how food is grown, how it's distributed, how much we eat, whether we get obese or not, all of those factors are in there. We can actually begin to figure out what the key elements are that we need to understand and include in our solution. Uh, our solutions must be system-wide, and they must be robust to the uncertainty since we will simply never know for sure what the future holds. Unfortunately, these kinds of solutions are the ones that are insensitive to the details, so we don't actually need to know everything about the solution for it to work. So just to go over the main points, great civilizations have risen and fallen on the health of their soil. Um, our civilization is now a global civilization. It doesn't have anywhere to move like previous civilizations. Um, a failure to envisage the system is the biggest threat and the biggest opportunity to finding solutions. So the fact that we have previously not been able to understand all the connections in the system was our biggest failing, but it's now the biggest opportunity, if provided we can do that. That mis our mis previous our continued mismanagement of the system, together with this system's perspe perspective, presents us with, I think, great opportunities for finding solutions fast enough that are robust to uncertainty. And in that sense, complexity is a friend, but we have to think big. And I think the take home message from what I'd like to say is, think big. Thanks.